Thanks a lot um, for those of you who made it early in the morning. So I'm going to give you an overview about EEG monitoring as um, I see some of the emerging fields in critical care. It's going to be a large overview and it's uh, going to go into many different directions. So feel free to ask me questions um, you know, at the end of this and even after this. It's my disclosures. Really apply. So I'll talk about seizure quantification and treatment. How, what can EEG monitoring do there? About ischemia detection, sedation monitoring. EEG assessment of consciousness and the depth EEG or intracortical EEG. So, in it's obviously EEG was first introduced to the critical care setting for the detection um, and quantification of seizures. And what an emerging field is that is you know we started doing this EEG monitoring, and it created an enormous amount of work. So a lot of people have to sit there and read all of that EEG. So one of the fields where EEG is developing is developing quantitative measures to sort of easily screen large amounts of data. So here, for example, you have somebody with what we call cyclic seizures. So they have seizures every couple of minutes. Um, here's somebody that had seizures here, then had acidosis, stopped seizing, was intubated, started seizing again, and was in a midazolam drip. So you can see the clinical course over time. It's like 12 hours of EEG. And here we had somebody with very, very frequent repetitive seizures, non-convulsive seizures uh, during eclampsia. And you can see here that the seizures became more and more and more frequent. And then we did a C-section and the patient never had a seizure again. So it allows you to screen large amounts of data. I'll show you a case here. This is a 57-year-old man with VT arrest, with cardiac arrest, at a rest time of 15 minutes, and he underwent hypothermia, was cathed transiently at an intra-aortic balloon pump. During the rewarming, we saw this pattern. And these are these repetitive discharges. They're going throughout, They're like generalized periodic discharges. You can see them speed up, become more frequent like this, and so this was cons consistent with the diagnosis of non-convulsive status epilepticus. What you do now, we treated the patient aggressively, controlled the seizures with, uh, with midazolam drip, lipoic acid and uh, uh, Keppra, and the seizures were controlled. So do you need to, any other data to talk to the family? So we felt that we wanted to get some of our prognostic measures, we got an MRI, SNCPs were unfortunately not done, even though I, I'm a big believer in them. Um, the, e, the clinical findings are listed up here. So what do you tell the family? So we think that that's not a bad prognostic sign. We encouraged the family or kept it open if they were in for it. And after reading the midazolam, this is what the EG showed. Again, the patient went into really even more high-frequency non-convulsive status. So what's your next move? A lot of people at that point would not continue, but we continued with midazolam, added some other non-drip anti-epileptics, and what would the outcome be? And I'm, I'm sure many of you know, but this is not definitely a death sentence. So this patient was discharged to rehab, mouthing words, he started to walk with a cane, and it had a quite good outcome. We shift gears, and this is going to happen a couple of times during this talk. Now I'm going to talk briefly about ischemia. So the EEG has an interesting feature. As you decrease the blood flow, normal blood flow to the brain is 35 to 50 ml per 100 gram brain per minute. As you decrease the blood flow to the brain, the EEG changes in a rather predictable way. So that allows you to use this as a detector of ischemia. What you can see here, there's a number of studies that have been done looking at um, quantitative EEG features to detect ischemia in real time. Usually this is done either in cardiac and arterectomy surgery or um, in subarachnoid hemorrhage models because you have a baseline before the patient is ischemic and then you can detect this change. If somebody comes with a stroke already, you don't have a baseline. So here is some of the emerging work on that. This is from the Boston group um, with Eric Rosenthal and, um, and uh, Brandon Westover. And they sort of combined a number of EEG, quantitative EEG features that have been described by some by them and some by others, and combine them to give you a prediction of how likely it is on a given day that a patient will go into vasospasm. So that may be something in the future, if we automate that, that helps you at the bedside to give you a sort of put you on high alert that the patient may be in the process of developing ischemia. How about sedation? So sedation affects the level of consciousness, it also affects the EEG. 
And there's a number of um, uh, anesthesia studies done where patients were, before the operation, these were patients that had uh, non-brain injury and not a brain surgery. They had the baseline here, then they underwent induction of anesthesia, were kept under during the surgery and then re-emerged afterwards after stopping the sedation. And you can see that there's a number of quantitative EEG features that have a spatial distribution that change. So one of the things, for example, is that the alpha power and the alpha coherence, so if one uh, in the alpha frequency, how one part of the brain correlates with the other, look, relocates from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. And as the patient re-emerges from anesthesia, relocates to the back of the brain. There's actually work being done by Emory Brown's group, which, is, which has done a lot of this work here at Boston, uh, to identify specific signatures in the quantitative EEG associated with different anesthetics. So potentially we can use that in the future as a target for our sedative management in during operations. If you want to take it one step further, this is um, also work from Boston here. You can use an automatic system here, a closed loop um, anesthesia delivery system where the EEG is detected and automatically gives feedback to the pumps infusing the sedation so that the EEG is kept at a steady level and this never goes in and out of too much or too little anesthesia. There's also EEG signatures that are correlated with different levels of consciousness. This has been uh, shown in TBI patients by Jacobo Sitz group in, uh, with, with uh, Lionel Nakash in Paris, who found in chronic disorder of consciousness quite significant changes in between patients that were following commands, minimally conscious state, and vegetative state, or which should be better called unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. In between these states, you can see signatures, and I just picked two. This is the alpha power, so the spectral frequency of alpha, and this is the theta permutation entropy, which is a complexity measure of the EEG, where you can see that they predictably change between these levels of consciousness. We were able to show that this may transcend in etiologies. So a very similar signature could we could found in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Can we actively detect uh, consciousness? And there's a lot of work that has been done over the years. Much of that work uh, was done by my co-chair, Stephen Norris, where they probed patients in chronic disorders of consciousness and presented them with auditory stimuli, asked them questions, and were able to detect a signature in the brain that was activated by specific questions. They took it actually a step further and used this functional MRI technique to reestablish a communication channel with the patient, which is very, very difficult to do. Oops. Um, the, um, what you, sorry, I pressed the phone button. So, uh, which is very difficult to do. And you can imagine that putting a patient into the MRI scanner, functional MRI testing, in the critical care setting is possible. And this was shown by Brian Edlow's group at, in Boston, but it's extremely challenging especially if you want to do it early on, if you want to do it while the patient is really sick, when we make most of our decisions about continuing more aggressive or less aggressive care, it's quite challenging to do that. So they um, also looked at EEG, they were able to detect signatures that detected cognitive motor dissociation, the state where your cognition is better than your motor response. We did a larger study of that and we were able to find that about 15% of patients in the critical care setting did have this cognitive motor dissociation and were able to respond, to dis distinguish between the words open your right hand and close your right hand. So a very, very small change in the command and they predictably, reliably were able to have a response in the EG. 15% of the patients did that was different to the ones that did not. This happened to be highly associated with functional outcome one year later. So this is actually something that's been shown as well here, that in resting state, when you look at this, this group's paper here, Jacobo Sitz group, they, if you falsely classified, if you just used your EEG, resting EEG assessment and classified patients what, based on the EEG, the level of consciousness would likely be, if the algorithm was wrong, it was much more likely that those patients would emerge out of this unresponsive state in the next couple of weeks and months. 
So there may be something that we detect there that we can otherwise not detect. We can also we do some invasive brain monitoring, and you'll hear, I think this is a nice segue to, the, um, to some of the other talks, because we do a lot of invasive brain monitoring in critical care, and uh, my friend Raymond Helbach is going to talk after me about cortical spreading depression, which I left out of here, but one thing that we did is we put these bundles in where we measure brain oxygen, you'll have to talk about that later on, microdialysis, blood flow measures, and we also put an intracortical brain monitoring device together with the ICP monitoring. And this is what the device looks like. It's a commercially available standard EEG electrode. And what you can sometimes see then is that on the surface you don't see any seizures, but on the depth you can see these spike wave discharges. So what does that mean? If you take, for example, one patient here, and this patient had a non-convulsive, uh, had uh, this patient here initially didn't uh, it here had uh, started to have a seizure and you look at the other brain monitoring parameters with this depth seizure the seizure on the on the electrode you see that the brain oxygen dropped actually all the way down to four this was like in the 20s before and this is four which is close to ischemic ranges the blood flow didn't change much but there's some calibration which is a specific problem the brain temperature rose and the icp only very briefly went up here but otherwise did not rise so if you aggregate a large number of patients here, and you can see that um, here is the baseline before the seizure, here's where the depth, this intracortical seizure starts, this is the red zone, is the first five minutes after the seizure, and then the next 25 minutes. What you can see here is that the heart rate goes up, the mean arterial pressure goes up, the respiratory rate goes up. That's all expected. That's what we know from how seizures behave. The ICP may go up a little bit, the jugular bulk oxygenation, which is the oxygen measurements in the uh, in IJ and in the intrajugular uh, vein, sort of the brain, the, the blood that's leaving the brain, sharply drops and then recalibrates here. And that probably is due to a diffuse, brief moment of increased metabolism. The brain oxygen drops here and the blood flow increases with a large delay. So you can sort of get an idea about the physiology, what's happening to these patients when they have these seizures. We can, a lot of a big problem in critical care is that we do EG monitoring, and it's not black and white, it's not seizures or no seizures, there's a lot of patterns in between. A lot of patients have these discharges that just relentlessly go on, and they don't speed up, they don't spread, but they just continue. And so they're, what to do with those? So there's a lot of controversy about this. And we think that the invasive brain monitoring can give us some hint about that. So here you can see somebody that has one of these discharges every other seconds. They're pretty blunt here. These are more sharply contoured every second. So between these brain lines is one second. Here they come even 1.5 times per, per second. And here they're up to 2 to 2.5 times. So when you look at what did the invasive brain monitoring parameters during these different patterns look like, you can see here that if you have very slow discharges, the, brain, uh, the, the blood flow is in this relatively low ra is, uh, range, this is relatively normal, but the, the distribution is wide, obviously, because there's some sicker and some less sick patients. And then as the frequency of these discharges increases, the blood flow increases, but only to a certain point, and then it doesn't really go much higher. The idea is probably, one, that these patients have impaired visual reactivity, and I think Gerrit is going to give us a talk about that. But the other problem is that once you've maximally dilated, you cannot dilate anymore, and there's not an increase of blood flow. What you see here is that as the frequency of these discharges goes above 1.5 hertz, that actually the brain oxygen drops. And this is something I think that Mauro Otto is going to talk about. The brain oxygen drops to relatively dangerous levels. Here is just uh, the change point analysis. So it's done by in patients, grouped patients, where the uh, frequency of the discharges increases, the brain oxygen drops. So in conclusion, seizures, regarding seizures, quantitative EEG increases the efficiency of quantification and supports the treatment strategies. EEG for ischemia may simplify the detection in real time, but it's still an emerging field. I'll tell you from personal experience, it's not easy to implement that. And there's all sorts of boluses of medications that can, that can give you false alarms. It's, not, it's quite challenging, but there's some, some work being done on that, in that field. Sedation monitoring, 
that may be something, especially in this Indian anesthesia setting, that has a huge potential, but potentially also in the critical care setting. EEG assessment of consciousness is, I'm probably biased there because that's my uh, biggest interest, but that's, I think it has a big um, potential there in the future. And then this intracranial EEG monitoring, I think it's, an, it's a component that is super important for this invasive brain monitoring because it does tell you something about the normal health. If you see the EEG, how the um, EEG is firing, that tells you something about in the context of the brain oxygen being low, it can put this into perspective. And this is the team I work with, and do we have time for questions? Not sure. Chairman? Thank you so much.